Um, so today I'm going to be talking about something that I now already know is familiar to everyone in the room who was here for this morning's keynote, um, which here, just for the sake of convenience, I'm going to call anaphoric deaccenting. Um, <clears throat> so I'll quickly run through what that is and then what I want to say about it. So if we have a sentence like, I don't like the viola, sorry viola players, if there are any, um, if we embed this in certain contexts, we can actually see a prosodic effect where we shift the nuclear pitch accent away from its default position in the sentence. So if I had an antecedent like, she thought I played the viola, then I might realize this as, but I don't like the viola, right? So I've shifted the nuclear pitch accent to like, and I've deaccented viola. So it's pretty intuitive what's going on here. <coughs> there is an identity relation linking the antecedent instance of viola and the target instance of viola that's deaccented here. Now, an effect that's pretty, pretty widely reported in the literature, or at least the meaning side literature, on prosody is that we can actually observe this effect under non-identity too. So if I change the sentence from I don't like the viola to I don't like string instruments, it's been reported that we can actually get the same effect. So if I had an antecedent like she thought I played the viola, I might still say, but I don't like string instruments. And again, it's pretty intuitive what's going on here. Viola is some kind of semantic antecedent for string instruments. One more example, just to show that this has also been uh, proposed for verbs, because that's the type of constituent I'm going to look at in my experiments. A pretty famous example, first John called Mary a Republican, and then she insulted him. Okay. So the idea here is that there's some kind of, maybe we could call it pragmatic identity between calling someone a Republican and insulting them. And so uh, by virtue of having this antecedent call a Republican, we can de-accent insult. Uh, so I'm going to massively oversimplify the background literature on anaphoric de-accenting and bin uh, the theoretical accounts into two different classes. Um, and then I'm going to suggest that maybe neither of them work very well. So, um, right, two different classes trying to explain the mechanism that licenses anaphoric deaccenting, and in particular, I'm going to focus on anaphoric deaccenting under non identity. So, these cases like viola string instrument or color republican insult. So, the first class of account that I'm going to talk about, uh, I call a one mechanism account. So the general strategy behind this type of account is to provide a unified grammatical constraint that can account for the deaccenting of identical material, like viola, viola, and the deaccenting of non-identical material, like viola, string instrument. So one type of constraint that we might see in this type of account is something like what I have up on the screen here that says you have to deaccent if the existential closure of whatever constituent you're considering is entailed by the existential closure of some antecedent constituent. So what does this look like for the cases of deaccenting that I've showed so far? When we have identity, like viola, viola, this works pretty trivially, right? There is a viola, entails that there is a viola. That's, hopefully everyone agrees. Um, <laughs> so we can deaccent the viola in the target sentence here, right? But the same constraint is at play, according to these accounts, uh, under non-identity, so if I have, she thought I played the viola, but I don't like string instruments, there is a viola, <laughs> entails there is some string instrument, right? So there's still a semantic antecedent for string instrument available, and we're able to de -exit. The other type of account, I'm going to call a two-mechanism account, and basically this account simplifies the grammatical constraint that licenses de-accenting, and then sort of complicates uh, the mechanism for getting de-accenting under non-identity. So according to these accounts, the grammar of deaccenting depends crucially on string identity between the antecedent and the target. So this gets us our viola viola case really straightforwardly. It just says deaccent if two constituents are identical. But this doesn't get us our viola string instrument case, right? So if we have an antecedent viola and a target string instrument, they're not identical, so the grammar here doesn't work. So what does this account say underlies the deaccenting here? Essentially, there's the second pragmatically driven module in this uh, theory that says you can accommodate an identical antecedent to the target if necessary. So when we have these two clauses, she thought I played the viola, I don't like string instruments, if I'm a hearer, this string instruments is what Fox calls accommodation seeking material. So it's deaccented but it doesn't have an identical correlate in the antecedent, which is supposed to be ungrammatical according to this model. So what I'll do as a listener instead 
is accommodate this covert antecedent that's reasonable because string instrument was inferable. So I'll kind of proceed as though the antecedent really were she thought I played a string instrument, and then I'll say that this deaccenting was acceptable. So I wanna run through a few different predictions that these two classes of account make. Um, the first is that actually both accounts are intended to account, uh, generate, sorry, they're both intended to generate deaccenting under non-identity. So these are both responses to the apparent felicitousness of the examples I've gone through so far. Um, the one mechanism account actually predicts that deaccenting of inferable and repeated material should both be mandatory in production and felicitous in perception. The two mechanism account, <coughs> excuse me, with that pragmatic mediation is sort of agnostic about what happens in production. Um, it hasn't really been formally baked into this theory that there's anything that enforces deaccenting of inferable material. But again, this predicts that people can readily deal with this when they encounter it in uh, perception. And the other uh, place where these two models pull apart a little bit that I want to talk about is uh, their predictions basically for any differential licensing between deaccenting on repeated constituents, so string identity, and on inferable constituents. So importantly, the one mechanism accounts because they use this unified grammatical constraint. There's not really any room for there to be a difference in felicitousness between deaccented identical material on the one hand and deaccented inferable material on the other. Whereas the two mechanism accounts at least leave the door open for that because there's actually two different mechanisms generating the two types of DX. So to quickly preview what I'm gonna do, um, I'm also gonna present four experiments, but I only have 20 minutes, so I'm gonna give even less detail, but hopefully you'll be able to follow along. They're pretty simple. So in experiments one and two, uh, we're gonna look at production, and I'm gonna show that we actually didn't find any evidence that speakers <laughs> deaccented inferable constituents in production. Um, which was demoralizing initially, but then <laughs> fun, it turned out. Um, in experiment three, I'm going to show you a perception study that showed that people didn't think deaccented inferable constituents sounded good. And then in experiment four, I'm going to show you a revised perception study that says essentially that people have really poor intuitions about what prosody should be doing in complex theory. <laughs> Um, so to preview my findings, the results are problematic for both of these accounts, basically because it turns out that people don't like these examples very much at all <laughs> of deaccented inferable material, but they're extra problematic for the one mechanism accounts. Um, so I'm going to recommend that the correct account, if there is one, is something like an even costlier version of the pragmatically mediated two mechanism account. Okay. So our very first experiment is a very basic production study. We just invited 10 people into our lab to read some sentences, and we recorded them. So we had people read these critical sentences embedded in a three-sentence carrier phrase. Um, and we had some controls um, just to sort of facilitate the extraction of prosodic data. So for example, there was a constant number of syllables before people got to the critical clause. We asked people to plan how they were going to pronounce the utterance before they started, because we didn't want people to sort of encounter a constituent and then realize after the fact that it was inferable or something. So we encourage people to read ahead. Um, what's happening in our critical sentences? So they're all of the forms subject, verb, object, and subject, verb, object. So we have this antecedent SVO clause and then sort of a target SVO clause where we're going to look at the prosody. Um, the second subject was always a monosyllable, discourse new here. The second object uh, in the data I'm going to present was always a trochee and critically discourse old. Um, so this object is repeated from the previous clause. And the reason I'm going to present those data is they're much more interesting because this puts the verb in the nuclear position. And everyone knows what that is now. Um, we do also have conditions where the object is discourse new, but unsurprisingly, nothing interesting happens there. Um, and then the really critical constituent that we're interested in here is the second verb. So we actually vary the discourse status of that verb, and I'm going to run through what the different conditions of that look like right now. <coughs> so in one condition, our second verb could be discourse new. So we might have a sentence like, Andrea rebuffed Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. I totally messed up the prosody, but the verb here, <laughs> that's like my dream prosody for it. Uh, the verb here, you rebuff, embrace, these verbs don't really have very much to do with each other. Uh, we might say embrace is discourse new, it might even be contrastive here. In our second condition, we might have a verb pair like hug and embrace. So there's actually an inferencing relation linking these two verbs. Embrace is somehow inferable from hug. 
I'll talk about that a little more in a second. Or the two verbs could be identical to each other, so embraced, embraced. So before I even get started, uh, we found it really difficult to come to any kind of agreement about inference relations in verbs, so we decided to just norm all of our stimuli. Um, so we did this experiment zero norming study where we asked people um, if A rebuffed B, how likely is it that A embraced B? Not very likely at all. If A hugged B, how likely is it that A embraced B? Very likely. And we didn't ask people about this one because we didn't want them to get mad at us, but we're hoping it's something like definitely. So uh, everyone knows from the keynote this morning what kind of canonical prosody we're expecting in our new and repeated condition. So in the new condition, we're expecting um, some kind of nuclear pitch accent on that second verb because it's discourse new, and then a de-accented object. Something like Andrea rebuffed Laura and Ron embraced Laura, right? Um, canonically, when the verb is discourse old, we would expect that also to be de-accented. So something like Christina embraced Laura and Ron embraced Laura. And the question here in experiment one is, do inferable verb sentences act more similar to the discourse new sentences or the discourse old sentences? So we extracted a couple different acoustic correlates of pro uh, prominence um, from the stressed nucleus of that verb, and these are the results. So on the far left, we have uh, mean intensity. In the middle, we have mean F0, and on the right, we have duration of the nucleus. And you can see a pretty consistent pattern that new and inferable verbs both had higher values to the exclusion of repeated verbs. And this comparison is significant in the way that it looks uh, in the stats. Before I talk about the implications of that, I'll just quickly go through experiment two. So Ming and I are both very uh, naive when it comes to sound things, or we used to be, before we got into prosody. Um, so we didn't really want to phonologically code these things ourselves, and we decided to just kind of crowdsource intuitions about whether the verbs were emphasized or de-emphasized in our production study by also throwing those on MTurk. So what we did in our experiment two is we took all of our recordings that came out of experiment one, we clipped away the first clause so that people didn't have any access to the discourse status of the verb, and then we just asked people to make a forced choice. Was the verb emphasized or not emphasized? And we put this on MTurk, and you can see basically exactly the same pattern. So I've plotted here is the proportion of times that people rated the verbs in each condition as emphasized, and again, we can see that people perceive new and inferable verbs to be emphasized and repeated verbs to be de-emphasized. So to wrap up the discussion of production here, it's fairly straightforward. New verbs, as expected, were accented. They had high phonetic values, and people perceived them as emphasized. Repeated verbs were de-accented. They had low phonetic values and were not perceived as emphasized. And critically, our inferable verbs didn't show any reliable differences at all from new verbs. So in other words, inferable verbs were not de-accented in production. So this is actually potentially problematic for both of the theoretical licensing accounts that I outlined, insofar as they're both designed to account for the phenomenon that we couldn't reproduce at all, right? Um, but it's particularly bad for the one mechanism account because as I said in the introduction, there's not really any room in this account for inferable and repeated material to get different scores, right? They have an identical grammar according to these accounts, so it's not really clear why they would pattern. <coughs> Technically, we could say that the two mechanism account is still tenable right now because it doesn't predict that de-accenting of inferable material is mandatory in production. Um, so we kind of decided that we need to move on to perception and see what happens there. Let me skip that slide quickly. So what we wanted to do is move on to this experiment three, where we put people instead in the shoes of a listener. So you're a listener and you encounter a speaker who, for whatever reason, licensed or not, decided to de-accent an inferable constituent. And we wanted to see how good people thought uh, those sentences sound. So from our production study, we have uh, recordings of sentences with a canonically accented verb in the second clause that I've boxed here. And we have recordings with a canonically de-accented verb in the second clause. So what we decided to do in this experiment is just cross-splice all of the clauses so that we could have a canonically accented or de-accented verb in a position where, on the surface, it has any of these discourse statuses. So, for example, we took our canonically accented second clause, cross-spliced it after the first clauses for the other discourse conditions, and get something that looks like this, right, I guess? And then we did the same thing for our canonically de-accented production. So we took the canonically de-accented second clause, thanks, we cross-spliced it into the other conditions, and so we have 
for example, on the, on the fourth line there, we have a verb that is surface discourse new, but produced as deaccepted. So um, just so you can hear what these sound like, I have all six, maybe. Laura and Ron embrace Laura. Oops. Andrea rebuffed Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. So you can hear that the verb too is accented there. Monica hugged Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. Christina embraced Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. That one's pretty weird, right? Yeah. Okay, good. It should be. <laughs> Andrea rebuffed Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. Veronica hugged Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. Christina embraced Laura, and Ron embraced Laura. Okay, so that's what our stimuli looked like for this experiment. Sound like, I guess. Uh, and we constructed the full set of stimuli here with one of our female speakers and one of our male speakers, and we put these on MTurk and asked people to rate something like how good the tune of the sentence sounded. We wanted them to focus specifically on prosody. And these are what the results look like. So when the verb was accented, we see that people think that new and inferable verbs, they sound pretty natural to have the pitch accent. And it sounds pretty unnatural for a repeated verb to be accented, right? Hopefully you felt something like that when I played the stimuli. And we see basically the reverse when the verb is de-accented. So repeated verbs sound very good when they're de-accented, and new and inferable verbs sound okay. They sound less good, but actually something that I'll highlight is that they don't sound as bad as, for example, our really bad ungrammatical fillers. That's just worth being aware of. So to recap this first perception study, repeated verbs sound good when they're de-accented, less good when accented, new and inferable show the opposite pattern, but it's not clear that less good here actually means bad, right? It's not as bad as some of the other really bad prosody that we put into this experiment. So again, this is sort of problematic for some of our theoretical accounts. Um, for the one mechanism account, this is problematic because again, we have this gap between the felicitousness ratings for inferable and repeated constituents, which is, not, which is not predicted. But it's also problematic for our two mechanism account because this mechanism is actually designed to say it's easy in perception to deal with this kind of stimulus, but people really didn't like de-accented inferable verbs still. Let's get through this quickly. So for our last experiment, we wanted to kind of put the two mechanism account on the spot and ask if we give people a supportive context that might help them do this accommodation that's supposed to be at play in the two mechanism account, does it get easier for people to accept de-accented inferable verbs? So what we did was we did experiment three again, except we had people first just read a context sentence that we hoped would informally, at least, construe the antecedent and inferable verb as pragmatically identical to each other. So something like this context sentence here, this is a little informal, some might work better than others in our set of stimuli. But something like people are at a high school reunion, everyone's seeing each other for the first time in 10 years, hopefully people get the idea that hugging and embracing, they're like both greetings or something, right? Um, they're not really distinct from each other in this context. Uh, so we had people read these context sentences and then listen to the same stimuli as last time. Um, when the verb was accented, we got a similar pattern, but somewhat lower ratings across the board. So the ratings are kind of moving towards the middle of the, uh, rating scale, and with a de-accented verb, which is what we're critically interested in, um, medium <laughs> is the answer. Everything just sounds medium to people. <laughs> and we actually completely lost the effect of discourse status on the verb in this experiment, too. Um, I don't have very much intelligence to say about that, so if people want to you know, suggest something to me about why that might be happening uh, during the question period or discussion period, that would be great. Um, so adding this context task uh, collapsed all of our naturalness scores toward the middle of the scale and eliminated the effect of discourse status on the ratings for de-accented verbs. So to quickly wrap up, um, in our experiments, we saw that, first of all, this general process of de-accenting and verbal constituents was sort of hard to detect in both production and perception. And also, uh, participants in this context task had pretty eroded intuitions about whether particular prosodic realizations of the sentence were appropriate for the discourse context or not. This is my sort of diplomatic way of saying that the meaning side theoretical literature on prosody doesn't really map very well onto the facts of prosody. And you're all primed to believe me from this morning's <laughs> I'm right. Um, so 
The last thing I want to say is it's a little bit unclear what to do with these examples that are so widely cited in the literature. Viola licensing the deaccenting of string instrument, Color Republican licensing the deaccenting of insult. I don't really have a very uh, strong suggestion right now, so that's another thing we might target in the discussion, but it's pretty clear that inferable and repeated material don't have the same grammatical status from my findings, so we might want to eliminate the one mechanism account. Um, at the same time, we see just generally lower felicitousness across the board in perception that, than what's predicted by the two mechanism account as it's construed in the literature. So this one doesn't seem to work very well either. The best recourse seems to be something like, this is pragmatics, but it's hard. Um, <laughs> so more than how easy it was predicted to be, according to maybe Fox's accommodation seeking material, accommodation here is something like difficult, costly, late, somehow non-trivial. Um, listeners need to think to make these things work, and maybe actually think explicitly and uh, link in the meta language what's happening to get these to be felicitous. I don't have much more to say about it than that, so thanks.